When FMS announced its giant scale de Havilland DH2 Beaver, I knew I had to have one. Let's take a look and see what we've got. The de Havilland DH2 Beaver is one of the classic short takeoff and landing light utility planes in the world. The Beaver first flew in 1947 and it has several variants. It's been flown both civilly and by several militaries. The full scale aircraft has a 30 foot length, a 48 foot wingspan, and is powered by a Pratt & Whitney R985 Wasp radial engine. It has a 455 mile range and cruises at a respectable 143 miles per hour. The Beaver that FMS modeled was built in 1966 and until recently flew out of Bellevue, Washington, according to public aircraft registration records. The FMS version of this Beaver has a 51 inch length, 79 inch wingspan, and is powered by a 4258 550 kV brushless motor powered by a recommended 6 cell 4000 milliamp hour battery. Let's take a look at what you'll see when you open the box. As you can see, the model comes packed tightly in a foam uh, shipping container. The, the fuselage here uh, on the picture is on the bottom and the wings are in slots at the top. You can see on the outside edge is the uh, propeller taped to one edge, the spars taped to the top, and uh, the extra pieces in a, in a container uh, sitting loose so they don't bang up against the, the rest of it. Now that we know what it looks like in the box, let's lay it out and see what we've got. As you can see, there are not a lot of parts to this model. We've got a nice large fuselage here with a hatch that's opened in the front where the windscreen is to get access to the battery and the other electronics that we'll be using in the model. We've got both wings, a couple of spars, the instruction. You can see the propeller down there laying on the wing. We've got a couple of um, halves to the horizontal stabilizer. The landing gear, which as I mentioned, was mounted at the bottom of the foam tub, so don't forget to look there. Some plastic parts. That'll be part of the assembly. And then over on the uh, other side, we've got the vertical stabilizer. So it looks like it's gonna go together pretty fast. Right now, I'm gonna take a little bit of time and review the instructions so that I understand the build process. Now that I've had some time with the instructions, it looks like the build is gonna proceed pretty straightforwardly. Let's get started with the empennage. So the first thing we're going to do is uh, put on the horizontal stabilizer. You can see it's got a spar that fit through the, the, the fuselage back there. It's the smaller of the two. We'll get it into its little section right there. And then we're gonna slide the fitting over the foam that makes up the horizontal stabilizer. And this is a really pretty snug fit. And so we're gonna just work that in there slowly because we've got the little two screw holes here that are kind of pushing down onto the foam. And so it's, and it's nice and tight. You saw that it moved there. And so now I've got that arranged in there. And so I had to push pretty hard there. Now, one of the things that's kind of interesting about this is that as I've looked at this, each of the places where you're gonna be putting in screws, instead of screwing into plastic, you're gonna be screwing into little brass fittings in there that have been molded into the, the plastic, which makes this just a whale of a lot stronger and easier to do. A lot of times with the smaller models, when you're putting in these little screws, you're always fearful of stripping out the plastic, and so these you're gonna be able to tighten down a little bit more. Again, they're brass fitting, so you can still strip them, and that's not good, but they're just little uh, socket type screws that fit right in there. And so next, since this is the side that has the, um, the flight controls on it, we're gonna do the, the ball screw underneath. Now, before I do that, 
I'll put this down into the camera range. I've just got a little battery box that I got at a, an electronic store. I've soldered on a servo lead, and then I can use this little circuit board type servo tester to make sure that I've got the servo centered before I make the connections. So the little ball connector just snaps on. There's a little round, uh, the ball part of the connector is already attached. At least it came that way with mine. And so I just use my fingers to snap the ball side on. The servo I uh, centered already, as I told you. And so I'm going to place the control rod through the hole there. I'm going to slide on the little uh, rubber keeper there. That's going to hold the clevis closed. Then place the clevis holder on top of the rod. And then just snap it onto the rod. And then slide the little rubber holder over the top all the way down to here to help hold the clevis on. Okay, so we've got the one on, and then in the plastic part, you're going to find this little square uh, piece of uh, carbon fiber, I think, maybe just hard plastic, but it's square. And it fits here into a square onto the elevator on the first side right there, and then it's going to fit into a corresponding hole here so that when the servo moves this elevator, the other elevator is going to move. And again, sliding the horizontal stabilizer over the spar and then working it in, and it's a really snug fit. So use some patience, kind of rock it back, try to get it in there because you've got the tension of the spar, the tension of this little connector, and then a real tight fit to start with to get it in there. Then when you've got the little brass uh, fittings in sight from those little top holes, again, just screw them on in to secure the horizontal stabilizer. Now at this point I wanted to make just a little bit of comment about using screws. I like using screws as opposed to glue because it allows you to have one of those oops moments where the wind takes the model off the table or you have a, someone steps on it and you can order, order the spare parts, undo the screws and pull them out. If you line these connectors with glue or these indentations with glue, you get your spare part, but then you've got major surgery to do on the, uh, on the fuselage or on these plastic mounts. And so for me personally, I just as soon spend a couple of extra seconds on the pre-flight to make sure everything is tight than I would gluing this stuff in. Personal preference, but I find that has a lot better potential for dealing with a replacement or a repair later on. So next up is the vertical stabilizer, and you can see that's going to go on pretty easily, pretty much the same way. The first thing we're going to do is take the servo lead that is there at the, uh, the tail of the plane, make sure that we've got the, the plus minus and the signal wires all uh, correctly aligned. Snap that in. And then all we're going to do is basically feed that wire in down into this little hole. It's quite a long lead, so there's going to be quite a bit that you can shove in there. And then, as we slide back into the fitting right here, so you can see it right here, we need to move the tail wheel so that little wire that's going to be our steering fits in the groove in the bottom of the rudder, which is a really clever way of putting that together and then just slide that on. Now the longest screw in the set is a black 32 millimeter screw and it goes right here. It's nice and color matched the uh, the black of the paint job here at the front. We'll screw that in and then one of the silver screws, the 26 millimeter screws, it's going to go in from the left side because if I noticed when I uh, put this down that the receiver was there on the right side, and so we're going in from the left. Again, just screwing it in, 
so it's nice and snug. And then finish up snugging that first one. And it's looking pretty good. Now the next thing the instructions call for is adding the landing gear. And that comes assembled. It came off the bottom of the shipping tub, as I mentioned. And it's just held in place with the remaining five of those silver-colored 26 millimeter long screws. And so it's just a matter of laying it in place, dropping it in, and then screwing it down. There are three screws on the bottom. And then there are two more. One comes in from the top on this side, and one comes in from the, the top on that side. So I'll flip that around. You don't need to watch me screw in screws. It'll be pretty obvious to you. At this point, I'm going to go off script or off the, the flow of the instructions and talk a little bit about some of the gluing that goes on with the model. There are a couple of ridges here, these uh, uh, kind of vortex generators or side force generators uh, that go uh, on, the, on the airplane. Uh, the, the spots are all molded in nicely and so you can um, you know, just kind of put them on and, and see if you've got them going the right way. So that's the right way with that one. And uh, we'll try this, this other one here. Yeah, the other way around. And so when they're on, when they're on right, they fit right into the ridges. And so that'll be the, the real key to doing that. You know, most of the time when I deal with EPO models, and this is an EPO model, I just use regular CA a lot of times. The instructions here called for foam safe CA, so I've got some uh, Zap brand uh, foam safe CA, and so I'll use it since it was called for. Other alternatives would be uh, polyurethane glue like Gorilla Glue, uh, foam tack, which is another contact cement, or maybe even the glue that came in one of the little nameless white tubes of one of your other models. But in any case, what we're going to do is we're just going to put some glue into these channels that this piece of plastic is going to fit into. I'm making a bit of a mess here. Come around the top. Make sure it's deep there into the channel. Slide it in, and I'm going to wipe off the excess and just work my way down. We've got the pitot tube that fits in little squares right here. We've got a couple of radio antennas on top of the fuselage and another uh, vortex generator or side force generator on the tail. They're all going to go in the same way, uh, and so just be mindful of um, making sure you've got them dry fit first, put them in with your glue, wipe off the end, and you'll have the glue parts done. When we get back from all that, we'll work on putting on the wings. So I finished up gluing the various pieces on the airplane. Strakes on the wings, these little vortex generators back here on the tail, and then the little um, uh, radio antennas that go here. Here I just used the tiniest little dot of glue because these things basically snap onto the sleeve uh, for the spar that goes through the top of the fuselage. Next, we're going to take a, just a minute or two to talk about some of the stuff that's going on inside the nose, since you've got some options here. As you can see, there's a lot of room in the fuselage for your electronics. If you wanted to put telemetry units in there or any of a number of things, there's plenty of room to do it. But you do have a couple of options when you uh, uh, power the model. First is just to take it as it comes in which case the EC5 plug, which is connected to the red and black wires from the ESC, you just find the battery with the right plug and you plug it in. 
Of course, in my case, the batteries that I have have different plugs, which means either an adapter or changing the plugs on the ESC wires, which is what I chose to do. So I've got these uh, four millimeter HTX banana plugs that come on the batteries that, that I have. These are rated at about 90 amps, the same as the EC5, so they should work just fine. The other thing I like to do, however, with models that are this size is to use an external BEC or universal BEC, sometimes referred to as a UBEC. And you can see that I've got that mounted here in the side pocket of the foam. And what it is is a UBEC that'll take input up to 26 volts. It's switch selectable output at five or six volts, and it provides five amps of power where most BECs provide three amps of power. I also, on big models or models with lots of servos, don't like the idea of having both the ESC and the BEC on the same circuit board. That way, if the ESC should happen to uh, have a problem and melt or blow up, which I've had happen, uh, then I'm not losing power to the receiver and I can dead stick the landing. It's a pretty spectacular crash when you see the smoke trailing your airplane and know that you are no longer in control. And uh, again, I've had that happen too. So with this particular setup with the UBEC is the other alternative, and that is I simply tapped into the positive and the negative wires right here, the insulation, uh, soldered them in, covered them with heat shrink, and that little pigtail goes to the pigtail power coming from the UBEC over here. So when I plug in the little blue LED on the UBEC will light up and it gets its power this way. And then you can see on this particular lead down here, I've got some shrink wrap around it. That's the servo lead coming from the ESC. And I don't want both the power from the ESC and the UBEC going into the model at the same time. So I pulled the center wire, which is the positive wire, out of that little servo style connector, bent it back and covered it with some heat shrink so it wouldn't short out. Uh, so I'm not powering the receiver from two different electrical sources. And so the throttle connector from the ESC goes into the throttle um, pin set for the receiver. And then the power from the UBEC goes into the battery bind pin set for the receiver. In this case, I'm using an orange brand receiver. You know, whatever receiver you use, you'll um, have to set up appropriately. And since those vary so much, I'm really not gonna spend any time talking about that. So basically the three choices you have is just use the EC5 plug and plug it right in. You're ready to go. Otherwise, if you have an alternate set of connectors, use the, um, the connectors you use. If you're going to use a UBEC, you can either tap the line or perhaps make your own adapter with a tap that's in line. So those are the choices you have when you want to power your model. The next thing we're going to do is put on the wings. And as you can see, one of the things they've advertised as a feature of this model are these plugs here that we're going to be mating to sockets on the wing instead of fishing uh, servo wires through the fuselage and and through the wing. So that looks like it should be pretty handy. And then we're just going to drop screws in here. So let's move the wing around and get that mated in. Now below the wing, you're not going to be able to see it, but at the same time, what I'm doing is sliding the wing support onto the the little plug it fits into on the bottom of the fuselage. You get the wing on first, it's, it's not going to fit. So we'll get that in there on this support strut, and then we'll push the wing in, a little resistance as those plug and sockets mate there where the flight control electrons are going to be flowing. And then we're just going to push the uh, spar through to make sure that we've got a good, nice, tight connection. At this point then, again, we'll just drop the screws into the wing, tighten them down,
so now that we've got the wing attached. So as we put the R-clip on, the instructions recommend or show it coming from the bottom. And so we're just going to take it, push it up through. You can hear it snap. And now I've got the uh, wing strut connected. They say that you're not supposed to transport this with the wings on, primarily because it's so big. And so uh, the getting the wings on and off should be pretty easy to fit in even a, a medium-sized car. At this point, I'm going to move to the other side and do the same thing on the other wing. Okay, so uh, I've done my radio programming to get the flaps and the right, correct um, servo movement and that kind of thing. Before I put on the propeller, you'd hate to uh, you know, reverse the throttle uh, while you're uh, working the, uh, the radio programming and end up having the, uh, the airplane chase you around the, the workshop. That would not be good. So usually it's the last thing I do is put the propeller on. So the spinner has a little hexagonal. Uh, and that fits onto the motor mount. Just slide that on. It's on nice and snug. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is mount the propeller numbers to the outside. Now before I've done this I actually uh, balanced the propeller and found that it balanced perfectly. I didn't need to do any adjusting at all. And then we're going to slide the propeller up against the curved side of the, the, the plastic spinner. Put on the washer, put on the nut, I'm going to use just a uh, crescent wrench to tighten the nut. Put the cover onto the spinner. And then that last silver 26 millimeter screw that you've been wondering what it goes to, well, it goes to the spinner cover. We'll mount that on there and it'll screw into the shaft. Tighten that up. And now we've got the assembly pretty much complete. I've got one more thing to do and that's to make sure we check the weight and balance. So let's do that now. So I discovered that the little CG machine that I have for my other models was too small for this, this large model. And so I did it the old-fashioned way. I simply uh, measured from the leading edge. Notice that it tapers in a little bit here. So I went to the full leading edge, measured back 73 millimeters. The range is 70 to 75. Uh, and then marked a dot on the little plastic underneath here with a Sharpie. Did the same thing on the other side. Marked that dot with a Sharpie. And then just used my fingertips to balance the airplane. And where I'd placed the battery here under the... Uh, the windscreen area uh, balanced perfectly. So I'm going to mark that with a, a pen so I know where to put the battery because there's a, quite a range, which also means you can use different size batteries and maybe batteries that way different than the one mine did. In any case, it did balance and it did seem to have a bit of a range in there where it balanced. I could move my fingers a little bit forward or aft and it would still balance nicely. So I think um, almost any battery and larger batteries are going to work in this particular model. And now for a couple of closing comments. The airplane really looks nice. I like that the decals that are on it are on smooth. The paint job is nice. The fit and the finish is all very, very good. It went together really easily as well. The screws with the little brass fittings or bushings uh, in each of the places where there are screws really made it it easy to, to align the pieces and drop the screws in and have them fit with some security knowing you're screwing into brass and not into, not into plastic. Um, one of the things I discovered after a, a false start is that um, there are a lot of those, um, well, several of those three millimeter by 26 millimeter screws. Basically, uh, the way you do that is if the screw is painted black, Screw it in where it's black. This one was the long one, but there are five landing gear screws. Uh, they all go in there. There were a couple of little screws called decoration screws on the label. They were the ones that went in sideways. I discovered that after I started counting screws a little later in the assembly. You may have noticed uh, that the screws are different than what may have been filmed that first thing. Uh, and then with silver screws on the top, because I ended up having used those when in fact I needed them for the top, and then the last silver uh, three by 26 millimeter went into the, uh, the spinner nose, 
um, cover to uh, put the little nose cone onto the spinner. So uh, aside from that little mix up, which was my own fault, um, everything fit together nicely. It was really pretty easy to do. One thing I did notice that I was, I'd call to your attention is that while I was moving the, the airplane for a camera shot, I just tapped the rudder and the little ball connection on the control horn popped right off. And I thought, oh, that's not good. I guess if you're going to lose a control, uh, rudder is probably the best one to lose if you're airborne, but that was not a good start. And so I looked at the screw and it was very tiny and it very barely went through the, um, um, the control horn. So what I did is I looked in some of the little bags of screws and stuff that come with uh, uh, small featherweight servos and found uh, a screw that was the same diameter, however, it was a millimeter or two longer than a really, really tiny screw that they had used to uh, screw down that ball and replaced it. Now that concerned me enough that I even uh, looked at the bottom ball connection down there to see uh, if that was going to be problematic, uh, but they had used a much longer screw down there. So why they didn't use it on the rudder, I'm not sure. You may want to check uh, to avoid uh, having a bump that disconnects the uh, control horn from the ball joint that is there on the back of uh, of your airplane so that you don't end up losing control. Obviously, losing an elevator in flight would not be a good thing. So all in all, I'm really pretty happy with this. You know, I've been following the um, thread on this on RC groups and people are doing some paint jobs. In fact, I have a couple of videos explaining how to to repaint uh, a foam model. This one would allow you to do that because it's mostly white. You'd have some pretty dark colors to get rid of, but uh, some primer and stuff, you could put this in your own livery if you choose to. Is it exactly scale? No, but really looks nice. And I'm looking forward to flying because from my perspective, um, having, you know, nine out of 10 people say, oh, look, a beaver is close enough to scale for me. And uh, having it fly well is the important thing. So let's take it outside and do a little bit of a video walk around to see how it looks. I can't wait to take it out to the field.